of Scripture and see how it speaks of Jesus, how it speaks of his gospel. God does not change. His character doesn't change. God is not uh, rough with people in the Old Testament and gracious with people in the New Testament. God is gracious to the people in the Old Testament, starting with Adam when he uh, leaves the garden and is clothed by the Lord himself. Uh, God provided a sacrificial system in Israel because he was gracious and patient with his people. He knew they'd sin, and he wanted to uh, distribute to them his patience, his forgiveness, and his patience. And so he symbolically took their sins from them and placed them on animals in the Old Testament, and those animals died in their place. That was all foreshadowing that Jesus would do the same as the, the Lamb of God. He would take our sins upon himself. So God is uh, one and the same, Old Testament and New Testament. So as we look at the book of Ruth, we look at not only what it was uh, uh, God saying to his people back when Ruth was written, but how this relates to Jesus. This is God's word, eternally true. Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So I went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother, Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabites, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption of the transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabites, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among, the fam from among his family and from the town records. Today, you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Here ends our reading. We have a response of thankfulness is printed for you there in the bottom left of your bulletin. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Last week we talked about how Jesus uh, was like his forebear, Boaz. Uh, we see here from this passage in the last verse that we read 
that, that Boaz, who married Ruth, uh, becomes the great-grandfather of, of David, King David. And we know from the Gospels that one of the frequent titles given to Jesus is Son of David. This was because Jesus was genetically from David. He was of David's line. This is why Jesus is born in Bethlehem, okay, where, where uh, Boaz was, where Elimelech was from, where Naomi was from, and where this scene takes place. The king, according to Genesis 49, was to be of the house of Judah. And so Boaz was, so David was, so Jesus was. And so Jesus, son of David, is reflected here in the character of Boaz. And we see Boaz here, and we talked about last week how he was selfless. And we talked about how if you want a life that is blessed, be selfless. It's one of the great paradoxes of the Christian life. If we want uh, more blessing, we should be selfless. We should be not seeking the blessing, not being quick to grab for ourselves, not selfish, but rather selfless. How do we do that? What does it mean to be selfless? How, how can we be selfless and, and survive? Um, Does being selfless mean that I need to give away all my money? Um, does being selfless mean that every person I see along the street or along the road, I need to help? Does it mean that I should give my car to that 16-year-old I see over there that I don't know? Probably not wise. Uh, does being selfless mean that we can sleep and not feel guilty. Because when we sleep, we're, we're not doing things for others, right? Um, does it mean we can eat? Do I need to give all my food away? What does being selfless mean? Uh, that's, what we look at, that's what we look at this morning. And what it involves, first of all, and we'll, we'll talk about having a balanced view of being selfless and how God wants us to be selfless in his way, um, we look at being selfless as a mentality. It's a mentality. Being selfless is a mentality. It's, it's rearranging your life. And I said to you last week, and this is the extension of it, that, that this is not just another sermon, one of many. It's not just another gospel lesson. This is a gospel lesson if you listen to, if you take this in, it will change your whole life. Your whole life will change. Your relationships will change. Your relationships with your kids will change. Your relationship with your spouse will change. Your relationship with your parents will change. Your relationship with your employees will change. Your relationship with your boss, your employers will change. What will happen at your funeral will change if you get this. And you'll live with joy. We all think in our sin nature. Satan wants us to think in our sin nature that if we live for self, that we'll have joy, that things will, will go well for us. And we talked about now in this uh, season of, of uh, contracts in the NFL, if you follow the sports world, they're, they're dealing people and trading people and all that kind of thing. And the question is, will somebody uh, surrender himself to a team for less money to be on a better team, Darrell Revis, or will he take as much money as he can get and go to the Jets? Okay, and, and you know, we're, we're, uh, what, what do we do? How, do? how do we do this? And so um, this mentality that we have, this mentality that we have uh, about selflessness means this. And it's your number one in your outline here. So being selfless, how? That's your blank there. Being selfless, how do we do this? What are the details of this? And the first three details are our, our attitude, our mentality in this. And as you looked at Philippians 2, as Bob read that for you, uh, Paul is getting the people in Philippi to be selfless. And he says it involves an attitude. And he says in verse 4, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Here's how you solve your relational problems in the church in Philippi. Here's how there are two women, Yodia and Syntyche, who they were fighting over stuff. Here's how you get along. 
you have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's an attitude. It's a mentality. And here's this. Number one, think about others. Think about others in everything you do. Think about others. Think about others. Think about others. Who do you think about? Others in everything you do. Don't do a thing without thinking about how this affects other people. You're not the you're you're not uh, Will Forte. You're not the what is the last man on earth? Uh, it's a new show on Fox. I was trying to watch it and I missed it. Uh, he wakes up. There's been a, a worldwide virus, and he's the only one left. And so he goes all around the world, seeing if there's anyone there. And he goes into St. Louis and all these towns, and nobody's there. You're not the only one on the earth. Everything you do affects the people around you. So think about others in everything you do. This is what this is what Boaz is doing to a degree, not perfectly but doing to a degree. Uh, Look at verse uh, 5. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi and Ruth, the Moabites, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. Here's what buying this property meant. It it wasn't like Monopoly, where you you just buy boardwalk off of somebody, you already own Park Place, now you get two, and you can put four houses and then a hotel on each, and then you win the game, right? Uh, That's not what it's about. If you buy this piece of property, you're giving it away to your dead brother. Because the first child you have with Ruth will be from Elimelech, the dead brother's line. And that property will go to his line and not your own. You'll keep your own property, but you won't gain any new property. And in fact, you'll have to fund this other property. I mentioned last week, it's like you find out a neighbor of yours is going into foreclosure and you buy his house for him and you just give it to him. You'll buy it to him and then rent it out as a good investment so he doesn't have to move. You buy the property and you just give it to him. That's what Boaz is doing. And that's what causes his uh, 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 relative to, to to shrink back. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. I have also acquired, this is what Boaz is declaring, he wants everybody to know, I have also acquired Ruth the Moabites, Malin's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead, not to make my name greater, but out of concern for my dead brother, out of concern for another, an other person, in order to maintain the name of the dead with this property so that his name will not disappear. Not so my name will be great, but so his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today, you are, you are witnesses. This is what Boaz is doing. And you can look in other passages there from chapter 2, from chapter 2, at how selfless Boaz was. His concern was for Naomi, this widow, too old to have kids of her own to carry on her husband's name in Israel. His concern was for Ruth, this Moabite. Moabites were the enemies of God's people. They had done bad things to God's people when they came out of Egypt. And his concern is for this Moabites who comes and and who is kind to her mother-in-law, Naomi, a Bethlehemite. He's concerned for her and he gives her grain and he gives her a place at the table and he's, he's kind to her. And he's concerned to her, of course, in in his willingness to marry her. But we don't see this just in Ruth. We see it come out in Paul as well. Uh, Bob read for us in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Here's what Paul says about his life. You know, Philippians 3, which we didn't read, Paul talks about his old life before he knew Jesus. He said, my old life before I knew Jesus was like this. It was building up a resume for myself. A Jew of Jew, a Pharisee of Pharisees, of the tribe of Benjamin, studied under this famous theological teacher in Israel, Gamaliel. I was up and coming. If you look in Acts chapter 7, that's about me. 
And I'm the one responsible for Stephen's death. And people did it to, to get in good with me. They lay their clothing at my feet after they stoned Stephen, this witness of Jesus, to death. My life was about me and about gaining prominence using God along the way to gain prominence. But he says this in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Here is how Jesus transforms us. Paul says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Here's what Paul's saying. My life isn't worth squat unless I'm using it for others. Specifically, that I use it for them coming to know Christ. And I'm going to spill myself out for this, for other people. I don't care what anyone thinks of me. I don't care about my former, former life. In Philippians 3, he calls that all a pile of dung, his former life, building up who he is in the eyes of other people. My life is worth nothing unless I use, unless I spill it out for other people. That's where life is. And so Paul talks about Jesus in Philippians 2 that Bob read for us. Almost said that Paul read for us. Consider yourself complimented, Bob. <laughs> Bob, the, the Apostle Bob. There we go. Philippians 2.4. Each of you should consider, should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus who though existing in the form of God, being in heaven prior to his incarnation, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't stay up in heaven. He didn't live life for himself. He came to earth for others, for us, to die for us, to bear our sins in his body and a cross, to live for us, to spill his life out, to be selfless for us, taking the form not just of a human being with all the frailties of a human being, but taking the form of a servant and serving his Father in heaven, even when his Father in heaven said, go to a cross for John and for Stephen. Go to a cross for Joe and for Reagan. He did it. He lived his life for others. Jesus didn't have to go to the cross for himself. He could have stayed in heaven, but he comes. He lives his life selflessly. So think about others in everything you do. That's what Jesus was thinking when he took his place as a zygote in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He was thinking not about himself and his glory. He had glory in heaven. He was thinking about us that directed his steps. And when he lived his life, he was thinking about other people, healing them and, and stilling seas and, and uh, exercising demons from them, giving them bread when they were hungry. He was living his life for other people. And he died for other people as well. So think about others in everything you do. You're here not for you. You're here for others. You're here for the people around you. That's why God has you here. Life is not about you. Life is not about me. And when we get that, that's when we get joy. That's when we get honor, like Boaz. That's when people hail us and say, isn't Boaz great? But Boaz wasn't seeking that. He was willing to go into financial ruin to do the right thing, to live his life for Naomi and for Ruth and for his dead brother Elimelech. That's how it works in the kingdom of God. Everything is topsy-turvy. Like Jesus said, the greatest of you should be the least because the greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant of all. The greatest in the kingdom of God is the one who doesn't care about himself. The one who just abandons himself to everybody else like Jesus did upon a cross. So think about others in everything you do. Second thing, second part of your mentality in selflessness. Ask, what could I do for this person? What could I do for this person? 
or how can I make this person's situation better? That's what you want to be asking in every waking moment of your life and even just a a hint forward and even how much sleep you get. Why do we get sleep? Because we want to be able to do for others well. I can't perform well for others if I'm getting three hours of sleep. Now, occasionally you need to fulfill your promises and you need to get three hours of sleep so that you fulfill your promises to somebody and make up that sleep later. But you're always asking, what could I do for this person? Whoever that person is, whether it's your spouse or your kid or your dad or your mom or your coworker or the woman at Walmart checking out your stuff. What can I do for this person to make her, to make his life better? Not how can this person make my life better? What can I extract from them? What can I get from them? How can I use them for me? But how can I expend myself for them? What can I do for them? See, that's what Jesus does. That's what Paul does. Those two spend their lives. That's what Boaz does. Spends his life saying, what can I do for this person in distress, Boaz says. So ask what you can do for this person. That's what Boaz did with Ruth and then Naomi. That's what Jesus from heaven before his incarnation did for you. He asked, what can I do for John? What can I do for Bob? What can I do for Carl? What can I do for Linda? What can I do for Lisa? What can I do for? How can I make her, how can I make his situation better? And know this, the answer is not always something. Sometimes the answer is nothing. I go to the gym three days a week and uh, you know, most of the time the answer is nothing. What can I do for this person? He's in the middle of a set. I can leave him alone. That's what I can do. But it's still a question in your mind. What can I, what can I do? Is there something I should do for this person? Okay? Uh, and, and that's what goes into, you know, do I open the door for somebody? Do they drop something, their hands are full, I can pick this up. You know, I see someone's carrying stuff out. Can I, can I do that? What can I do for this person? But sometimes it's just nothing. Most of the time it's nothing. Okay, you, you pass by how many thousands of people every day? Okay, you can't do something for every person. Most of the time the answer is nothing. Sometimes it's something. It's a, it's a, it's a little something um, that you can do. You can say, hey, I'm going to say hi to this person. I'm going to go over and, and, and say uh, uh, hello to him. Or this person's checking, you know, I'm checking out at, at Walmart, and I, I say, how are you doing? It doesn't cost me a lot to say that. But we think about other people. Okay? How's her day? How is it working at Walmart right now? How much longer does she have to work today? What did she give up to be here on Saturday to work here at Walmart? What's her life like? See, we're we're, we're thinking about others. What can I do to make her getting through this day better? Most of the time, it's minimal effort stuff. Here's something important. Don't stress out by thinking living selflessly is always doing the maximum. If you think living selflessly is doing the maximum, you will quit. Okay? If you ever have started an exercise program, you probably have heard, don't start out doing your goal. That's what I always want to do. <laughs> How to get there now. You know, I do my goal right now. But don't do the maximum or you'll quit. It's just going to be too hard. Okay? If you're helping everyone you see along the street, it's going to be exhausting and you're going to have nothing left and you're going to say, that doesn't work. Okay, So don't stress yourself out by doing the maximum stuff. Do rather what you're able, not what will put you in the grave or not what will make you, you bitter. But sometimes it's more. Uh, examples in a bit. Third thing about your mentality. So first, we think about others and everything we do. Second thing, we say, what could I do for this person? Third thing, quit being concerned about yourself. Quit being concerned about yourself. Okay, these are three sides of a three-sided coin. Um, quit being concerned about yourself. Quit asking, how will this work out for me? What will this mean for me? Will I have any benefit from this? And we see this in, in 5 and 10 
uh, here like we looked at before, verses 6 and 8. Look at 6 and 8. We looked at 5 and 10, how, how Boaz was concerned about Naomi and Ruth, and, and he was just going to do this. It was the right thing to do. <laughs> but, but look in contrast here uh, to 6 and 8. Look at verse 6. At this, finding out that the property would go to his dead brother, Elimelech, at this, the kinsman redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. He was concerned about himself, about his own estate. He just he states it there. At least he's honest. I'm not going to do what Deuteronomy 25 requires me to do or be shamed by all of Israel. I am not going to do that. Why? Because my own estate might be endangered. If you redeem it yourself, I cannot do it. Verse 8. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. <laughs> Here, I'll do it for you. I don't care. I'm saving my own estate. Okay? I don't even see this as shame. And in our culture, being selfish, you don't have to, most of the time, be shamed. But in the kingdom of God, if you're selfish, be shamed. Okay? Because the kingdom of God is about living for others. Following Jesus is about doing what Jesus does, living for others. Saying, what can I do? What can I give? How can I be so that this other person prospers, so that things go well, so that things go well with him, regardless of what happens to me? So Acts chapter 20, verse 22, and you can turn to Acts there, 20, Acts 20. Paul gets this. Um, he gets this from, from, from Boaz. He got it from Jesus. Um, it's not concerned about himself. Acts chapter 20, verse 22. Verse 22. And now he tells this group of elders from Ephesus. He says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city... The Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. He's not concerned for himself. Hey, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I may wind up in prison. I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to face hardships. So what? I'm not concerned about myself. Or Philippians 2.6, who, speaking of Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Jesus was looking at how he could serve others, now, not how others could serve him. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, didn't care for his reputation, didn't care for what he was getting. He humbled himself, though he was rich, like we read in our declaration the gospel you know the grace of our lord jesus christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes for your sakes he became poor so that through his poverty you might become rich rich spiritually through his poverty through his being shamed through his humility he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross Jesus was not concerned for self. He was not asking the question, how will this turn out for me? So we should do this too. So balance, uh, balance for us. How do we balance this out? Um, number one, first of all, how do I know if something is something I should do or not do? Um, uh, should I lose sleep over this or, or get good sleep? Uh, should I give this away or keep this? Where, where's the balance come from? A couple of, couple of qualifiers that we see from Scripture. Number one, meet your set and promised obligations and responsibilities first. Okay? Um, I am responsible. I always tell people uh, you know, about the church here. I love the church here. But um, you know, I, I know it's my responsibility to be Betsy's husband until I die. I'm vowed up, okay? 
Um, so I know that. And so that sets my priorities. Okay. Um, we look at what we've promised and we fulfill our promises. That is being selfless, fulfilling our promises. And we don't be not people of our words in order to be selfless to somebody. If being selfless for somebody's sake means I don't fulfill my promise and I leave somebody in the lurch, that's another blank for you there. Yeah, that's number two. Don't leave those who are depending on you in the lurch in order to be selfless to someone for whom you're not officially responsible. If there's somebody you don't know, you know, and they need help getting stuff, there's a whole pile of stuff, you know, if, uh, back to the gym, there's a whole pile of stuff, this didn't actually happen, but there's a whole pile of stuff, boxes at the front door of the gym, and there's somebody loading it into his truck, but I need to get home so I can get to test at a school on time. I bypass those boxes, don't I? I need to be, I need to use my selflessness to fulfill my promises, my obligations. I am responsible as a parent to get my child to school on time. And I put her in a lurch, I get her in trouble if I don't get her to school on time. And so when you're thinking about being selfless in some kind of wacky way, in some kind of irregular way, you got to say, what are my responsibilities? What, do, what am I obligated to fulfill? Okay, if, if there's a, a conversation that um, I'm uh, getting into with somebody and it's five o'clock, you know, I make dinner for our family. Okay, and if it's five o'clock and somebody has to be somewhere at seven o'clock and there's a conversation that's starting where I can really minister, I already start thinking, hey, we really need to talk about this. This is very important. Can we meet for breakfast tomorrow? Can we meet for lunch tomorrow and talk about this? Or do you need to talk about today? I can call you back at about 7.30. Because I have responsibilities. I'm not being selfless to those to whom I'm responsible. And I need to be selfless to those to whom I'm responsible. Okay? So that's a qualifier for us. When we're thinking about being selfless, we're always doing stuff for other people. But we want to look to those that God has placed in our lives to be responsible to them, to love them, to be selfless to them. Boaz had a responsibility as a brother, a cousin of some kind, to Elimelech, that his, his name would continue on. Elimelech's name would continue on. He didn't have a responsibility with some other Moabite that came into town or that came into some other place somewhere else in Israel. But he had a responsibility there. Jesus had a responsibility to us because his father had elected his people before the creation of the world, Ephesians 4 tells us. Jesus had a responsibility to fulfill, a responsibility that led him to be selfless for us. So, so he does that. So meet your set and promised obligations, Ecclesiastes 5.4. Fulfill your vows. If you promise to do something, do it. And be there, or number two there, don't leave people who are depending on you in the lurch. Okay. Okay. So uh, what, does this, what does this mean for us? Um, we we want to be, uh, quit being concerned about B, quit being concerned about your movable schedule. Okay. Quit being concerned about your movable schedule. And start thinking about your schedule as more movable than you now see it. Okay, so that example you know, a person's talking to me, um, move things around, okay? Move things around. Uh, well, we can do this over here. We can do the things over here. One of the great blessings of having kids is you learn to do that all the time. <laughs> You're always moving stuff around. You know, people say, hey, I can't meet today. It's like, no problem. You know, it's, I've got like 75 other things to do. <laughs> That's okay. You know, uh, it's, uh, but, but think of your schedule as movable. Now, if somebody's depending on you to have something to them at 1.15 in the afternoon, don't move that. They're depending on you. Be selfless to them and for their sake. But move things around for other people. Be, be selfless in that way. And so Luke 10. I'm always just guilted to death on Luke 10. It's the, uh, the story of the... the, uh, um, not the uh, uh, the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is the guy who moves the schedule. 
hey, there's a guy going along and he gets robbed and he's left for dead. And uh, the good Samaritan comes along, the Samaritan man comes along, and he moves the schedule all around. And he takes care of the guy's wound, he quits going to, you know, on the trip he's going on, takes care of the guy's wounds, takes the guy to a hotel, uh, to an inn, and, and gives of his money to, so that this guy would be taken care of. And uh, boy, that's a, what an interruption. What an interruption in the day. But he moves his schedule. He's not concerned about his own schedule. Apparently, he didn't have obligations in Jerusalem when he's going there. Okay? So Boaz does this as well. He moves things around. What was he going to do that day? It's an important man. But he moves things around. He goes out to the city gate and he waits. And he sees his kinsman redeemer. He says, hey, you're who I'm looking for. Sit here at the town gate. Deuteronomy 25 in process here. Sit here at the town gate. And he waits and gathers other, you know, these other elders of the town and other people. And he spends his day doing this for the sake of another, for his dead brother, Elimelech, okay? Second thing um, there, uh, quit or see there, but don't be, quit being concerned about your non-essential resources. Quit being concerned about your non-essential resources, your stuff. Okay, I mentioned uh, my, my dad last week. He'd always see stuff. I'm not wearing anything of his today either. Um, and sometimes I, well, I am. Uh, he gave me this watch. Um, uh, 1994, and uh, he he was unconcerned about his stuff. Uh, I've got I've got another coat I can wear. I've got another tie I can wear. I've got another this I can wear. Here, you like this shirt? You know, uh, uh, t- take it. Here, go ahead. Um, be be unconcerned about your resources more than you are right now. Um, I'm very concerned about my resources. It's really tough for me to give up my, re- my stuff to somebody else. I remember being almost floored uh, as a, a, a poor seminary student and uh, on a break where uh, somebody got a, a Coke out of the Coke machine and somebody came up and said, oh, Coke, that sounds good. And, and the guy reached down and he said, here, you want it? And he gave it to this guy and put more money in to get a Coke for himself. And I thought, wow, that was 55 cents. <laughs> But, you know, the parable of the wise steward um, that, that Jesus gives in Luke 16, it, it, Jesus, the punchline of that is sometimes people of the world know how to use money to make friends. And we, the people of God, should use our money to make friends because people are more important than money. People are more important than our resources. Okay? And so we're free with our resources where they're non-essential. Okay, if you need to get to work in a half an hour, don't give your car away. If you have no other way of getting there, don't lend it away to somebody else. Okay, but non-essential resources, say, sure, take it. And, and, and know, like an a, a old friend of mine said once who had a truck, you know, he said, yeah, I lend my truck out. And I don't worry when it comes back with a ding or a scratch or whatever. That's what truck's for, right? And I thought, wow. What a good example to me. You know, I'd be like, oh man, I lent out my truck and, and it got, I did drive a truck once, a light blue, powder blue Chevy Love, 1976. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I'd be like, oh man, I, I gave out this thing and it came back worse. Now I shouldn't give out any stuff. That's how sin nature in me thinks. That's how the world thinks. But Jesus says, right, Luke 6, give. Don't worry about getting back. That's the way the world does things. Don't give to get interest, to get it back with interest. Just just give. Hey, can you use this? Great. Fantastic. Go ahead. I remember early, some of you are, have been in the church long enough to know Mike Golombowski was a deacon in the church, and, and he gave us his power washer to use, and I broke it. And... Uh, he said, oh, don't worry about it. He said, I think that thing's under warranty anyway. It was completely a non-problem for him. I mean, he was never even, like, disappointed at all. Uh, and and I, he, he did get a new uh, power washer out of it, but he took care of all that. He just, you know, that was a pain. 
but he didn't act like that was the deal. He used his not, hey, I'm not going to die if I don't have this power washer. I'm not going to die if I have to buy another power washer. This is my pastor, and he's my friend. I'm not going to get upset over this. That's what Mike had going on in his heart and in his mind in that. And that's what Jesus pushes us to do. That's what Boaz encourages us to do. Hey, I may lose my whole estate here, but hey, it's just stuff. You know, the, the near kinsman redeemer, he doesn't have his stuff that he was so worried about 2,000 years ago. He hasn't had it for 2,000 years. It's just stuff. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pass. We're, we're not going to take any of it with us. And so, so we, give it, we give it freely. So applications, applications for us in arenas. Uh, and there are passages for us to, uh, to look up um, here. Parents, we're always asking the question, how, how can I serve my kids? And it's not that we're following our kids around, our kids are our bosses, but we're developing our kids. What can I do for my child? What does my child need here? Now we're still teaching uh, lessons of responsibility, and our kids don't lead our homes, but we're spilling ourselves out for our kids. There are things we're not doing because our kids are there. I always would grieve when I was a golfer, and I would hear people like over at the news, and they'd be saying, oh, I love being coming here on a Saturday. I get away from my kids. And, and that's, not, that's, not our, that's not our mentality. We're living for our kids. Okay, so, so you know, don't, don't, go, don't go exercise when your kids are at home. Uh, get up at four in the morning if you need to and exercise then when your kids are still, still asleep. Your officers who are in training... Uh, would meet here at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning so that they would be here before their kids were, well, some of their kids were even awake. Um, I would go home and my whole family was still asleep <laughs> after that. But we're thinking about what can we do as parents, uh, spouses, husbands. Ephesians 5.25 says, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So husbands, you're asking, what can I, how can I give myself up for my wife? What can I do for my wife? What, what does she need? What can I provide for her? What does she need from me personally? Does she need me to listen? Does she need me to have these things done? Okay, we're always asking this question as a husband. Now, as a wife, I'm going to say something very biblical and very, very countercultural here. You know, if we look at, at Scripture, we look back at David and say, how in the world could he have multiple wives? And we're right for asking that question. But it was cultural back then. You know, all the nations around Israel, you know, kings had multiple wives. And so David was just doing what everybody else did. The kings of Israel, they were doing what everybody else did. Solomon was doing what all the other kings of the, the world did. Here's what we have in our, our lives. Genesis 2.18, you know what that says? It says, the reason you wives were made wives was to be a helper to your husbands. Not to have independent lives, uh, but your question is to be, how can I help my husband? Now, that doesn't mean you don't work. Sometimes working outside the home is the way you help your husband. But you're always asking that question, how can I help my husband? It's not the other way around where the husband is asked, how can I help my wife? I've been put here as a helper to my wife. No, Adam was there, and he's given Eve as a helper. How can, we, how, can, how can I make my husband succeed more? What can I do to help him more? God says I will make him a helper suitable for him. So wives ask how, they can, how, how can I help my husband? What's his agenda and how can I help him in that agenda? That's very countercultural, but your argument is with God, not with me. That's my that's my rest in saying this to you. Kids, um, what about you? How can you be selfless towards your parents? Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. You ask, how can I help in various things? Does mom need help? Does dad need help? Um, you you, you want to uh, mature as you get older in, in being less taking and more giving. And of course, as we get to be adult kids, uh, we get to give to our parents more and more because we're more able so that's toward your parents, toward your teachers. Romans 13, 1 through 2 says, obey your authorities and submit to them. That means for your teachers, for your coaches, for those who are uh, in charge of you, uh, you're to be selfless to them. You're to, to fit into their agenda. 
toward your siblings. Uh, this means quitting, quit treating them like enemies and bothers. Um, how can I help my sibling? I was very fortunate. My, I was the youngest child, and my older brother and sister, they asked this question. How can I help John succeed? My brother wanted me to succeed more than I wanted to succeed, and sometimes he would push me around, literally. He'd say, come on, man. <laughs> He'd take my shoulders and push me, <laughs> you know, about that. He, he desired me to succeed, and, to, and, and that's what you do as siblings. You say, how can I help my sibling with this. If you're an older sibling, wow, you have an opportunity to help your younger siblings. If, you, if you're a younger sibling and you see you, you know, your older siblings doing something, they're, they're playing it for the school or they're doing this or they're doing that, you know, how can you get something together for them so that they're, they're better at what they do? Okay. This is how siblings behave in the Christian faith. Um, workplace. Uh, toward our superiors, toward our inferiors, toward our peers. We're doing things for our boss. We're being submissive. We're not being argumentative toward them. We're being easy for them to command, as long as they're not asking us to do something immoral. We ask ourselves, with my boss, I want to be an easy employee for him to have. I want to be selfless. Hey, can you take care of this for me? I say, well, no, I can't because I have to do this, but I can get so-and-so to do that. Is that okay? How can I make this happen? How can I be selfless toward your inferiors? What can you do for them to make their working for you easier? When I was in Orlando and I, I, I worked as a, um, in our church, not a fish, I didn't get paid, as a Sunday school teacher and a children's worship leader, we had a, a, a woman who was a director of children's ministries, and she was just like this. She was always setting everything up for us. So we had everything as teachers that we needed. And we want to do that for those who are under us in the workplace. And toward our peers, uh, we, we want to give our, our, our cloak, our tunic, you know, to, to somebody else, as Jesus uh, speaks about. We want to, uh, with our non-essential time, if we have extra time, how can I help my coworker with this project? How can I help him in, in this thing? How can I help her in this thing? And then lastly, E, at the store. And I mentioned this uh, before. Are you a problem customer? Don't be a problem customer. How about at the doctor's office or the dentist's office? Okay. Be appreciative of the people who are taking care of you. Be appreciative of the, the woman at the dollar store, the, 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 the manager at Walmart or the, the checkout person at Walmart. Be appreciative of the people around you. When, when you're driving along the street and they're, they're the folks with the stop and slow signs when there's construction going on, give them a wave, smile at them. They're out in the hot sun or the cold, cold rainy earth out there. Okay? How can I make their situation better? It doesn't mean if you, if you need something that you don't ask at Walmart. Ask somebody, but make it easy for them. Understand they've got a life too and, and, and things are tough. Don't be a problem customers. When workers see you at Walmart, they should say, ah, her, ah, him. Boy, he's always nice. If they see you down, coming down through the line, they say, okay, good, nice customer coming. Okay. This is how we should be. We should be selfless people thinking about others. How is their life? How's their day going? What can I do for my kids? What can I do for my spouse? What can I do for my parents? What can I do for everyone at my workplace? What can I do in everyday life for the people around me so that their lives are better? So conclusion. Um, Christ is our example here. Christ is our example. Um, he lives for others. He lives for people who hated him. He says on the cross, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He's up there for them, that they might be forgiven. As we live selflessly, therefore, we get to show off who Jesus is. Selfless. And so, in your conclusion there, really? That's your blank. Really? And your second blank is like it. Really? Do this. Really, really live selflessly. Be selfless. Uh, 
It's what it means to be a Christian. It, what it mean, it's what it means to follow, to follow Jesus. Um, this is a difference that should mark every Christian from the non-Christian. It's one of the nice things about living in a, an, an increasingly non-Christian culture. We stand out, like Paul said in Ephesians, like stars in the night sky. We stand out. And we want to stand out not by listening only to Christian music, not by wearing Christian t-shirts. You can do that. But you don't want to stand out just by that and everybody say, but that guy's a real jerk. You want to stand out by being selfless, by being like Jesus, by people saying, I want to be around, be around him. I want to have him on my work team. I want to have him come down my aisle at the store. I want to have him come in as my patient today. Okay? That's how we want to stand out, by being selfless, by being concerned for the people around us. So here's your blank. Christ, your king, has been this. He has been, as your king, selfless for you. So next blank. You, as a citizen of Christ's kingdom, be like your king and be this for others and therefore show others what Christ, your king, is like. What we see in Boaz is that selflessness leads to blessing. Selflessness leads to joy. Not only for Boaz, he gets a hot wife, right? Uh, but for Naomi, for dead Elimelech, for Boaz himself, he becomes this honored man. And in Jesus, we see it the same. Jesus, who lives, spills his life out, makes himself nothing. He's given into Philippians 2 the position of the greatest honor ever given to anyone who's tread the face of this earth. Be selfless. It pays off for you, pays off for others, and it shows people what Jesus is like.